This is Greg Pass with the Americans of Wartime Experience. Today's date is March the 5th, 2022, and I am in Arlington, Virginia, at the Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to sit down with Specialist Ben Vogt. Ben, thanks for uh, spending time with us today. Yeah, thank you. I um, appreciate it. Give us your full name and where you were born. I'm Benjamin Martin Vogt. I'm from Riverside County, California. I was actually born in Riverside, but I grew up in San Bernardino. And uh, any military veterans in your family? Yes, my father was uh, military police. He was stationed out in Germany for a good stint, and then my brother also served as a combat medic, and he served in the United Emirates and uh, the Ar Ar Arabian, Arabian uh, something. I, I can't. I can't remember specifically. I know it was the Arab Emirates, and then. Uh, I Somewhere can't remember. That yeah, he was he was a combat medic, and that, he deployed out out that way, and then um, he's in the reserves currently. Gotcha. So, um, what was your motivation to enlist in the U.S. Army? Well, originally, I didn't have. Um, I was kind of stuck in a in a, kind of a loop, I guess, if I if you will. I was going to school, and then I didn't have enough money to pay for school, so then I would get a job. And then I would lose my job while I was trying to get to go into school. So I was kind of stuck in this circle and I kind of went to a recruiter. Um, he told me basically the benefits of joining the Army. And I thought it, would, I thought it was a very good experience, um, a good opportunity. So I ended up enlisting. Um, and two weeks later, I was shipped out to Fort Benning. Wow, your MOS? 11 Bravo. So. Um Take us through generally what uh, basic training is like. One, sta one, one station unit training. That's what that is, right? There, is that correct? Yes, sir. So, what kind of, what kind of training? How long did it take? It was a 14-week program. I think we were one of the last cycles that weren't uh, 22 weeks, which is three months, uh, roughly three months. I, I want to say, um, and then they switched it to 22 weeks, which is now f uh, four and a half months. Um, we were the last 14 week cycle. I volunteered to do 22 weeks, but they just trimmed it down. And it was basically uh, just giving you the rough basics of how to be a soldier, how to do infantry tasks, how to understand that. And then once you showed that you were proficient in that area and the aspect, then you would go to your duty station afterwards. And your first duty station was? Fort Myer, yeah. I got stationed here um, in 2019, and I came straight down to the tomb. I didn't know anything about Arlington or the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It sounded like a really cool experience. Um, I was really, I met one of the tomb guards that was down here at Buffalo Wild Wings, actually, and over the over the four day that I came here, and he told me to check it out, give it a uh, give it a go, see if I'd like it. And I've been down here ever since. Um, that was two and a half years ago. Tell, tell me um, a little bit about your first impression the first time you came here as an observer and watched the uh, guards. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Because when I first came down here and I watched uh, the change, I thought, yeah, there, there's no way I can do that. I, it's not really, that's not in my repertoire. Is I can't really stand out and do that that really precise actions that they do out there. And I was kind of overwhelmed thinking I wasn't sure what I was getting into at the time. So yeah, it was, it was a lot to take in at, at the first moment, but step by step and day by day, after a while you start kind of catching on and getting the basics. Um, uh, hopefully that answered yeah. correctly. Huh? So at some point in time, you, you, you slapped down a packet to, to apply for the position. Tell, tell us how, how the, um, the application process um, and your training, how does that progress? Yeah, so, um, so you volunteer, of course, to be in the Army. You sign um, a contract with the Army. And then once you get to your duty station, um, such as Fort Myer, you actually volunteer to come down to the tomb. So you're a triple volunteer. You volunteer to be in the Army, and then you volunteer to come to Fort Myer, and then you volunteer to come down to the tomb. And that's kind of the basis of what we go on 
uh, is that everyone that comes down here wants to be down here and they know what they're doing and they're adamant and motivated to conduct the mission um, and conduct it with precision and to the best of their ability as well. So, as I understand it, there's a battalion. There's just one, there's just one platoon that's handling the duties here at the tomb. Is that accurate? Yeah, this is its own separate um, specialty platoon. So it's branched off of um, Fort Myer up top. Um, it's totally branched off. We'll kind of do a selection process for guys that are up top or at 4-3, um, 1-3. They'll go through a selection process and then come down here. We'll pick guys from up top and then also we'll um, get guys like me who just just came fresh in and then they'll kind of volunteer to come down to the tomb as well. So if you if you did not volunteer to serve um, at the tomb, you might be handling other duties at ANC such as burials, uh, ceremonies like that? Exactly. They have, uh, so they have uh, drill teams that conduct the drill and ceremonies for various projects that the military uh, worldwide or not yeah worldwide does um, such as like football military ceremonies they'll they conduct a lot of the drill and ceremony that gets done there and then there's the caisson platoon that you might know of as well and then there's rifle firing parties and whatnot there's a every each platoon has its various um, things that it specifies in doing so, um, okay, so as I understand it, there's a lot you guys are going to learn, 17 pages of knowledge, um, everything from your uniform. How long did it take you to train yourself to pass your test? Um, so it varies from person to person. Um, in specific, uh, it, take, it t usually takes around a couple months to get from one test to the, to the next test to be able to get there. There's big leaps, so when you first get here, um, of course, we don't expect you to have a uniform that a Sentinel would be wearing. Um, and then after a couple months, because um, we go through training processes where we'll come in in the morning, we'll check off uniforms, we'll make sure that they're good to go, and then you'll kind of write down things that you need to work on, things that need to, measurements that need to get fixed, and then after, you know, several months of doing this, it's almost an implied task. So you come in and you're not, you don't have to be told, hey, this measurement is, uh, needs to be fixed and, and whatnot. You come in, you check your measurements, you make sure that they're good to go, you make sure your uniform's good to go as a whole. And that's kind of what, what you are training to become is that you're, you're becoming self-sufficient pretty much. How long does it take to get a uniform ready? So we usually do re uh, uniform reset right at the close of business. It takes me around uh, an hour or so, but it, it, it varies from person to person, um, kind of experience wise. And then of course the guys coming in that are a little bit newer, um, let's say I have um, a person under myself, I'll go in after they're done and then make sure that their uniform's good. Um, go through that process that we do in the morning. Well, I'll do it at the close of business as well. Make sure that his uniform's good to go so that he's set up for success for the next day. Um, so tell me about your first time you walked. Um, yeah, I was, I was very new. I was really, really nervous. Um, what we call ceremonial composure down here, you know, straight face. I wasn't very good at that. So I was more scared that I was gonna, I felt like I was kind of trapped in like this, uh, like, a, like a statue, like a mold of myself. I was really scared going out there, especially in front of the crowd. My first day walk was midsummer um, in the morning as well. And there was a huge crowd outside. Um, about two years ago before COVID hit, um, big, big crowds. And I actually got my first walk that day. I was really excited, but 
I was also really nervous because um, it's a lot of pressure. It is a lot of pressure going out and you know being able to see hundreds of people to your left and to your right, um, knowing that everything that you do is really precise and the guys down stairs are gonna be harder than what um, civilians or people that come to the cemetery will notice and that's kind of the goal is that you notice stuff while you're out there and you're like shoot I could have done that better or, or whatnot and that's where, that's where the nerves kick in I, I remember vividly going out uh, first couple walks and I asked one of the senior um, tomb guards here if if the nerves ever go away and he said no the nerves never go away that's how you know that you care about this place pretty much so what do you do I mean do you, how do you psych yourself up for that do you just try to get into a zone and just focus on the yeah uh, people, other most people kind of have their their own thing um, I kind of laugh and, and joke beforehand maybe play a, like a hype up song or if I will uh, while I'm changing and then um, I've been here long enough now that I, I'm more focused on things that are happening in the guard change I'm more focused um, it's kind of muscle memory at this point so I know exactly what's happening and I'm kind of like looking around making sure that nothing crazy happens during the changes of course when I was first coming in I, it was all on uh, you know, hitting the rifle over to the side, giving myself uh, that right space so I can make that pop, put it in my shoulder. I was focused on all of that and making my steps in, in count with everyone else's steps and the clicks, of course. Um, so at, as you progress, of course, you are still focused on the guard change, but it's probably broadens to different aspects. So in November, it was a big, big event here, um, the anniversary um, ceremony. Tell us a little bit about the planning that went into that and your role in the ceremonies. Um, so I was a walker on the mat. I know that there was a lot of planning, uh, pre-planning pretty much. Uh, the former platoon sergeant that was here, Sergeant Porterfield, did a lot of pr planning and uh, prepping. They held a lot of uh, meetings for relief commanders. So uh, my role was more of kind of getting what the planning was done, making sure that you know the roses didn't pile up too high, um, making sure that nothing, uh, the, there, was, there was a lot of uh, line, there was people that were securing the front of the line and the back of the line. And I was more of a Upon, I was just making sure that everything was cohesive. It was the, the most stress was on the relief commanders, platoon sergeant, um, the platoon leader as well. Um, there, that was they handled most of the of the stress, and then we made sure that the mission got carried out. So I understand you guys had to do um, some adjustments out there with the mat and everything. Tell us about that, and how did that work out for everybody? Yeah. So uh, the night before the tenth of November. We rolled up the mat, uh, we took it to the other side of the tomb, and then laid it out, uh, measured it out accordingly so that it would mirror the mat that was in the front. And then, of course, so that people could come pay their respects and lay roses. Um, as far as the experience, it was definitely, it was definitely a different experience. I've, I've had the mat rolled to the front one time before. Um, for construction, they had to do a lot of, uh, I can't think of the, the word, um, preserve, preservation. They had to do a lot of preservation on the, uh, on the tomb because it's uh, so old, it's suffered a little bit of uh, damage. But as far as the different experience uh, on the mat in the front, is the mat will come down and there's a huge crack right right in between uh, where the front of the front of the tomb is where the mat is so it's almost it's almost like you're walking like on a tightrope it, it feels kind of strange um, it's strange that you have to do rifle manual differently because um, you're now facing the opposite direction 
it was strange that uh, the press pit was so close to me. It was felt like it was like maybe a foot away from me, and it was it was kind of uh, I guess surreal seeing that the photographers right there right next to me with my left eye because usually that's something that I'm watching out for so my secondhand uh, instinct was really just watching over the press pit and everything going on it definitely made the hour go by really really fast because there was so much going on um, you could see so much while you were walking everything that was going on so um, yeah that, that was definitely an experience in itself. So this is a big deal. I mean, this is a hundred year anniversary. What's it like to be a part of something like that? I mean, all eyes are on you. At the end of the day, regardless of how many people, I know a lot of people help um, plan, a lot of work going into this. At the end of the day, when you're on that mat, everybody's eyes are on you. What does that feel like to be, be the center of, of, of well, correct? You're not the center of focus, I should say. The two Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I, I, you get what I'm saying? You're, put, you're playing yeah. a part in such an important role. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're, what you're uh, talking about because we were more instruments in the grand symphony of what was going on, which was that people had the chance to come pay their respects, something that they got to do uh, s subtly 100 years ago. Um, 1926, they started guarding the t uh, military, started guarding the tomb, making sure that people um, couldn't desecrate or disrespect the tomb. But before people could come and pay their respects, come and visit the World War I unknown, uh, lay roses on the tomb, and to be able to do that a hundred years later, it was, it was very surreal, a hundred percent. There was a lot of distractions going on. It was more caught up in the moment um, rather than reflecting on what was going on. It was, it was very awesome to be able to see people's emotions and reactions in playing or laying the, the roses at the tomb. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on and we just played a part in the whole role of the rose laying. It was more for people to come out and pay their respects Definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of VIPs and, and uh, veterans groups that were there. Um, I understand that the, um, oh, forgive me, not the Cherokee Nation, the, yes. the Crow Nation. Yes. Uh, tell, tell us about um, the Crow Nation, their participation, and why that was important. Um, so I wasn't actually on that day. That was that was uh, first relief. They were on the first day. Uh, I was more part of the uh, the second day. So, or I was there first day. Um, my apologies. Se or first relief was on the second day. So we did kind of the whole broad in scope, and then we set up the wreath around the tomb for the next day. Um, yeah, we didn't see the Cronation come out. I might be switching updates, so my apologies. I, I can't remember if we worked first or second day, but we were instrumental in putting up the roses in almost like a bouquet fashion around the tomb. Um, it was actually the relief commander on duty. It was his idea to kind of set them out in an array of bo like a bouquet around the tomb. and. It was, it was kind of funny because it was like 10 o'clock at night and we're like all just getting hyped about this idea and we're like, yeah, 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 we'll do that. Like, we'll, we'll tuck the roses in and we'll tuck the flowers in around so that it'll kind of create this really uh, beautiful, almost wreath around the tomb. And it came out really well. We actually had the um, ANC workers come out and bring extra flowers um, peoples that had been laid previously and we were able to get everyone's flower around that that tomb and create that that bouquet that was I think the second day what, what are some of your um, fondest memories or what stands out in your mind about the ceremony particularly how the public reacted to it yeah there was a there was a lot of uh, there was a lot going on so um, I, d 
don't, I can't vividly remember specific um, reactions. There was a lot of, you know, people silent and wanted to pay respect, but also um, be respectful at the same time. There was people that came and laid their flowers and you could see that their eyes were soaking. Uh, there was tears coming down their face and there wasn't very much uh, that happened that was like out of the ordinary. It was kind of uh, expected that people would be very emotional coming to lay flowers and roses at the tomb, that they would be an, um, emotional while it was happening. Um, so there wasn't anything uh, in particular that stood out specifically to me. Um, yeah, that, that's it. So um, obviously you're not, you're not interacting with the public and talking to them when you're, you're guarding the tomb, but you do have opportunities to do that, aside from the ceremony, just overall. Um, can you give us any, any examples or um, observations you had on when you've had um, communication with the public out here? Um, do they appear to be very, do they appear to understand how significant this place is? Have they shared anything with you that, that is memorable to you? Yeah, uh, it comes in it comes in waves. Uh, there's definitely a lot of tourists that come down here that have no idea about ANC, uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. They ask a lot of questions. They want to know. It's kind of they're like absorbing all of the information all in one go. Um, and then there's people that come down here that have visited Arlington National Cemetery and the tomb, and they are a lot more, I don't want to say respectful, but um, they understand a lot more. Maybe it's their first time, maybe it's their fifth time. Um, so it comes in, in variations. What was the second question? Um, you, you answered it. You answered okay. It. Um, during some of these conversations, I'm assuming you've, you've talked with school groups before. Um, if you had a 16-year-old kid and he's standing there, he's like, this is really cool, I want to do this. What advice would you give him on how he could um, um, be successful in becoming a, um, a sentinel? Um, as a 16-year-old, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, younger kids come here straight out of high school. So if that was something that they wanted to do, it's definitely obtainable. Um, being a sentinel takes a lot of maturity, understanding. It's really easy to get lost in the day-to-day -day operation and forget about what's really happening here because it's a lot much or it's a lot more or much more than just one singular person. Uh, we all look the same pretty much out there and that's for a reason because it's not really about the guard. It's about the tomb of the unknown soldier. So. I guess my best advice would be to have a, a sense of maturity in coming here and understanding of maybe do your homework uh, on what happens down here, the object or the object of the mission and why we do the things that we do. So we're videotaping this right now, obviously, and in, in, in a few weeks you're going to receive a a digital copy of the, the, the video. You're also going to receive some instructions on how you can send your own video to the Library of Congress across the Potomac at the, um, at the archives for the Veterans History Project. Theoretically, that video is going to be here a couple hundred years from now. One of your great, 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 great grandkids might stumble upon the video. What would you want them to know about your service to your country? I, I think it's just begun. This is my first contract. I, I really do plan on staying in. Um, I have a lot of things in motion. Um, of course, I have a beautiful wife that I still talk it over with, so there's a lot of things in motion, but as far as my military service, as, as far as right now, I think it's just begun. So um, I have had a really good opportunity of serving here as my first duty station, getting a grasp of everything that goes on down here. I did, I, had no idea about this place or anything about um, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier 
at all. I'm from California, so it's all the way across the uh, across the country. So I, I had no idea about this place, and I'm lucky to have been able to serve here in the first place. Are there any other memories or anything you wanted to share with us before we stop the tape? Nothing, uh, nothing in particular. There's nothing that comes to, to mind. Gotcha. Well, um, thank you for your service. Thank you for taking the time, and it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Well Appreciate it.